Seth Speaks, The Eternal Validity of the Soul, by Jane Roberts, Notes by Robert Butts, read by Martin John. Part 1, Chapter 1. I do not have a physical body, yet I am writing this book. Session 511, January 21, 1970. 9.10 p.m. Wednesday. Now, I bid you, Joseph, a good evening. Our friend Rupert does indeed have stage fright, and to some extent this is understandable, so I bear with him. However, let us begin with Chapter 1. Rupert may write an introduction if he likes. Chapter 1. You have heard of ghost hunters. I can quite literally be called a ghost writer, though I do not approve of the term ghost. It is true that I am usually not seen in physical terms. I do not like the word spirit either, and yet if your definition of that word implies the idea of a personality without a physical body, then I would have to agree that that description fits me. I address an unseen audience. However, I know that my readers exist, and therefore I shall ask each of them now to grant me the same privilege. I write this book through the auspices of a woman of whom I have become quite fond. To others, it seems strange that I address her as Rupert and him, but the fact is that I have known her in other times and places by other names. She has been both a man and a woman, and the entire identity who has lived these separate lives can be designated by the name of Rupert. Names are not important, however. My name is Seth. Names are simply designations, symbols, and yet since you must use them, I shall also. I write this book with the cooperation of Rupert, who speaks the words for me. In this life, Rupert is called Jane, and her husband, Robert Butts, takes down the words that Jane speaks. I call him Joseph. My readers may suppose that they are physical creatures bound with men physical bodies, imprisoned with men bone, flesh, and skin. If you believe that your existence is dependent upon this corporal image, then you will feel in danger of extinction, for no physical form lasts, and no body, however beautiful in youth, retains the same vigor and enchantment in old age. If you identify with your youth, or beauty, or intellect, or accomplishments, then there is the constant gnawing knowledge that these attributes can and will vanish. I'm writing this book to assure you that this is not the case. Basically, you are no more of a physical being than I am and I have donned and discarded more bodies than I care to tell. Personalities who do not exist do not write books. I am quite independent of a physical image, and so are you. Consciousness creates form. It is not the other way around. All personalities are not physical. It is only because you are so busily concerned with daily matters that you do not realize that there is a portion of you who knows that its own powers are far superior to those shown by the ordinary self. You have each lived other existences, and that knowledge is within you, though you are not consciously aware of it. I hope that this book will serve to release the deeply intuitive self within each of my readers, and to bring to them the foreground of consciousness whatever particular insights will serve you most. As I begin this book, it is late January, 
in your time, 1970. Rupert is a slim, dark-haired, quick woman now, who sits in a rocker and speaks these words for me. My consciousness is fairly well focused within Rupert's body. It is a cold night. This is our first experience in writing a complete book in trance, and Rupert was somewhat nervous before the session began. It is not just a simple matter of having this woman speak for me. There are many manipulations necessary and psychological adjustments. We have established what I refer to as a psychological bridge between us, that is, between Rupert and myself. I do not speak through Rupert as one might through a telephone. Instead, there is a psychological extension, a projection of characteristics on both of our parts and this I use for our communications. Later, I will explain how this psychological framework is created and maintained, for it is like a road that must be kept clear of debris. You would be much better off in reading this book if you asked yourself who you are rather than ask who I am. For you cannot understand what I am unless you understand the nature of personality and the characteristics of consciousness. If you believe firmly that your consciousness is locked up somewhere inside your skull and is powerless to escape it, if you feel that your consciousness ends at the boundary of your body, then you sell yourself short and you will think that I am a delusion. I am no more a delusion than you are, and that may be a loaded sentence. I can say this to each of my readers honestly. I am older than you are, at least in terms of age as you think of it. If a writer can qualify as any kind of authority on the basis of age, therefore, then I should get a medal. I am an energy personality essence no longer focused in physical matter. As such, I am aware of some truths that many of you seem to have forgotten. I hope to remind you of these. I do not speak so much to the part of you that you think of as yourself as to the part of you that you do not know, that you have to some extent denied and to some extent forgotten. That part of you that reads this book, even, as you read it. I speak to those who believe in a God, and those who do not. To those who believe that science will find all answers as to the nature of reality, and to those who do not. I hope to give you clues that will enable you to study the nature of reality for yourself as you have never studied it before. There are several things that I shall ask you to understand. You are not stuck in time like a fly in a closed bottle, whose wings are therefore useless. You cannot trust your physical senses to give you a true picture of reality. They are lovely liars, with such a fantastic tale to tell that you believe it without question. You are sometimes wiser, more creative, and far more knowledgeable when you are dreaming than when you are awake. These statements may seem highly dubious to you now, but when we are finished, I hope that you will see that they are plain statements of fact. What I will tell you has been told before throughout the centuries, and given again when it was forgotten. I hope to clarify many points that have been distorted through the years, and I offer my original interpretation of others, for no knowledge exists in a vacuum, and all information must be interpreted and colored by the personality who holds it and passes it on. Therefore, I describe a reality as I know it, 
and my experience in many layers and dimensions. This is not to say that other realities do not exist. I have been conscious before your earth was formed. To write this book, and in most of my communications with Rupert, I adopt from my own bank of past personalities those characteristics that seem appropriate. There are many of us, personalities like myself, unfocused in physical matter or time. Our existence seems strange to you only because you do not realize the true potentials of personality and you are hypnotized by your own limited concepts. I am primarily a teacher, but I have not been a man of letters per se. I am primarily a personality with a message. You create the world that you know. You have been given perhaps the most awesome gift of all, the ability to project your thoughts outward into physical form. The gift brings a responsibility and many of you are tempted to congratulate yourselves on the successes of your lives and blame God, fate, and society for your failures. In like manner, mankind has a tendency to project his own guilt and his own errors upon a Father God image, who it seems must grow weary of so many complaints. The fact is that each of you create your own physical reality, and in mass, you create both the glories and the terrors that exist within your earthly experience. Until you realize that you are the creators, you will refuse to accept this responsibility, nor can you blame a devil for the world's misfortunes. You have grown sophisticated enough to realize that the devil is a projection of your own psyche, but you have not grown wise enough to learn how to use your creativity constructively. Most of my readers are familiar with the term muscle-bound. As a race, you have grown ego-bound instead, held in a spiritual rigidity with the intuitive portions of the self either denied or distorted beyond any recognition. Before I end this session, I ask you to imagine our setting, for Rupert has told me that a writer must be careful to set the scene. I speak through Rupert twice a week on Mondays and Wednesdays in this same large living room. The lights are always lit. This evening it is an enjoyable for me to look out through Rupert's eyes at the wintry corner beyond. Physical reality has always been refreshing to me and through Rupert's cooperation and as I write this book I see that I was correct in appreciating its unique charms. There is one other character to be mentioned here, Willie the Cat, a beloved monster who is now sleepy. The nature of animal consciousness in itself is a highly interesting subject and one that we will later consider. The cat is aware of my presence and has on several occasions reacted rather noticeably to it. In this book, I hope to show the constant interactions that occur between all units of consciousness, the communication that leaps beyond the barriers of species, and in some of these discussions, we will use Willie as a case in point. Session 512, January 27, 1970, 9.02 p.m. Tuesday. Good evening. Now let us return to our new manuscript. Since we have mentioned animals, let me say here that they do possess a kind of consciousness that does not allow them as many freedoms as your own. Yet at the same time, they are not hampered in its use by certain characteristics that often impede the practical potential of the human consciousness. 
Consciousness is a way of perceiving the various dimensions of reality. Consciousness, as you know it, is highly specialized. The physical senses allow you to perceive the three-dimensional world, and yet by their very nature they can inhibit the perception of other equally valid dimensions. Most of you identify with your daily physical-oriented self, you would not think of identifying with one portion of your body and ignoring all other parts. And yet you are doing the same thing when you imagine that the egotistical self carries the burden of your identity. I'm telling you that you are not a cosmic bag of bones and flesh thrown together through some mixture of chemicals and elements. I'm telling you that your consciousness is not some fiery product formed merely accidentally through the interworkings of chemical components. You are not a forsaken offshoot of physical matter, nor is your consciousness meant to vanish like a puff of smoke. Instead, you form the physical body that you know at a deeply unconscious level with great discrimination, miraculous clarity, and intimate unconscious knowledge of each minute cell that composes it. This is not meant symbolically. Now because your conscious mind, as you think of it, is not aware of these activities, you do not identify with this inner portion of yourselves. You prefer to identify with the part of you who watches television or cooks or works. The part of you think knows what it is doing. But this seemingly unconscious portion of yourself is far more knowledgeable and upon its smooth functioning your entire physical existence depends. This portion is conscious, aware, alert. It is you, so focused in physical reality, who do not listen to its voice, who do not understand that it is the great psychological strength from which your physical-oriented self springs. I call this seemingly unconscious the inner ego for it directs all inner activities. It correlates information that is perceived not through the physical senses, but through other inner channels. It is the inner perceiver of reality that exists beyond the three-dimensional. It carries within it the memory of each of your past existences. It looks into subjective dimensions that are literally infinite, and from these subjective dimensions all objective realities flow. All necessary information is given to you through these inner channels, and unbelievable inner activities take place before you can so much as lift a finger, flicker an eyelid, or read this sentence upon the page. This portion of your identity is quite natively clairvoyant and telepathic, so that you are warned of disasters before they occur, whether or not you consciously accept the message. And all communication takes place long before a word is spoken. The outer ego and the inner ego operate together the one to enable you to manipulate in the world that you know, the other to bring you those delicate inner perceptions without which physical existence could not be maintained. There is, however, a portion of you, the deeper identity, who forms both the inner ego and the outer ego, who decided that you would be a physical being in this place and in this time. This is the core of your identity, the psychic seed from which you sprang, the multidimensional personality of which you are a part. For those of you who wonder where I place the subconscious, as psychologists think of it, 
You can imagine it as a meeting place, so to speak, between the outer and inner egos. You must understand that there is no real divisions to the self, however, so we speak of various portions only to make the basic idea clear. Since we are addressing individuals who do identify with the normally conscious self, I bring such matters up in this first chapter because I will be using the terms later in the book and because I want to state the fact of multidimensional personality as soon as possible. You cannot understand yourselves and you cannot accept my independent existence until you rid yourself of the notion that personality is a here and now attribute of the consciousness. Now, some of the things that I may say about physical reality in this book may startle you, but remember that I am viewing it from an entirely different standpoint. You are presently focused entirely within it, wondering perhaps what else, if anything, there may be outside. I am outside returning momentarily to a dimension that I know and loved. I am not, in your terms, a resident, however. While I have a psychic passport, there are still some problems of translation, inconveniences of entry that I must contend with. Many people, I hear, have lived for years within New York City and never taken a tour through the Empire State Building, while many foreigners are well acquainted with it. And so, while you have a physical address, I may still be able to point out some very strange and miraculous psychic and psychological structures within your own system of reality that you have ignored. I hope quite frankly, to do far more than this. I hope to take you on a tour through the levels of reality that are available to you and to guide you on a journey through the dimensions of your own psychological structure to open up whole areas of your own consciousness of which you have been relatively unaware. I hope, therefore, not only to explain the multidimensional aspects of personality, but to give each reader some glimpses of that greater identity that is his own. The self that you know is but one fragment of your entire identity. These fragment selves are not strung together, however, like beads of a string. They are more like the various skins of an onion, or segments of an orange, all connected through the one vitality and growing out into various realities while springing from the same source. I'm not comparing personality to an orange or an onion, but I want to emphasize that as these things grow from within outward, so does each fragment of the entire self. You observe the outside aspect of objects. Your physical senses permit you to perceive the exterior forms to which you then react, but your physical senses to some extent force you to perceive reality in this matter, and the inside vitality within matter and form is not so apparent. I can tell you, for example, that there is consciousness even within a nail, but few of my readers will take me seriously enough to stop in mid-sentence and say good morning or good afternoon to the nearest nail that they can find stuck in a piece of wood. Nevertheless, the atoms and molecules within the nail do possess their own kind of consciousness. Atoms and molecules that make up the pages of this book are also, within their own level, aware. Nothing exists, neither rock, mineral, plant, animal, or air, that is not filled with consciousness of its own kind. So you stand amid a constant vital commotion 
a gestalt of aware energy, and you are yourselves physically composed of conscious cells that carry within themselves the realization of their own identity, that cooperate willingly to form the corporal structure that is your physical body. I am saying, of course, that there is no such thing as dead matter. There is no object that is not formed by consciousness, and each consciousness, regardless of its degree, rejoices in sensation and creativity. You cannot understand what you are unless you understand such matters. For convenience sake, you close out the multitudinous inner communications that leap between the tiniest parts of your flesh, yet even as physical creatures you are to some extent a portion of other consciousnesses. There are no limitations to the self. There are no limitations to its potentials. You can adopt artificial limitations through your own ignorance, however. You can identify for example, with your outer ego alone, and cut yourself off from abilities that are a part of you. You can deny, but you cannot change the facts. The personality is multidimensional, even though many people hide their heads, figuratively speaking, in the sand of three-dimensional existence and pretend there is nothing more. In this book, I hope to pull some heads out of the sand. I do not mean to underestimate the outer ego. You have simply overestimated it. Nor has its true nature been recognized. We have more to say concerning this point, but for now is enough to realize that your sense of identity and continuity is not dependent upon the ego. Now at times I'll be using the term camouflage, referring to the physical world to which the outer ego relates, for physical form is one of the camouflages that reality adopts. The camouflage is real, and yet there is a much greater reality within it, the vitality that gave it form. Your physical senses then allow you to perceive this camouflage, for they are attuned to it in a highly specialized manner. But to sense the reality within the form requires a different sort of attention and more delicate manipulations than the physical senses provide. The ego is a jealous god, and it wants its interests served. It does not want to admit the reality of any dimensions except those within which it feels comfortable and can understand. It was meant to be an aid, but it has been allowed to become a tyrant. Even so, it is much more resilient and eager to learn than is generally supposed. It is not naively as rigid as it seems. Its curiosity can be of great value. If you have a limited conception of the nature of reality, then your ego will do its best to keep you in the small and closed area of your accepted reality. If, on the other hand, your intuitions and creative instincts are allowed freedom, then they communicate some knowledge of greater dimensions to this most physically oriented portion of your personality. Session 513, February 5, 1970, 9.10 p.m. Thursday. Good evening. Now we will continue. The fact of this book is proof that the ego does not have the whole kettle of personality to itself, for there is no doubt that it is being produced by some other personality than that of the writer known as Jane Roberts, since that Jane Roberts has no abilities that are not inherent in the race as a whole. Then 
at the very least it must be admitted that human personality has many more attributes than those usually ascribed to it i hope to explain what these abilities are and point out ways that each individual can use to release these potentials personality is a gestalt of ever-changing perception it is the part of the identity which perceives I do not force my perceptions upon the woman through whom I speak, nor is her consciousness blotted out during our communications. Instead, there is an expansion of her consciousness and a projection of energy that is directed away from three-dimensional reality. This concentration away from the physical system may make it appear as if her consciousness is blotted out. Instead, more is added to it. Now, from my own field of reality, I focus my attention toward the woman, but the words that she speaks, these words upon the pages, are not initially verbal at all. In the first place, language, as you know of it, is a slow affair, letter by letter strung out to make a word, and words to make a sentence, the result of a linear thought pattern. Language, as you know it, is partially and grammatically the end product of your physical time sequences. You can only focus upon so many things at one time, and your language structure is not given to the communication of intricate simultaneous experience. I am aware of a different kind of experience, not linear, and can focus upon and react to an infinite variety of simultaneous events. Rupert could not express them, and so they must be leveled out into linear expression if they are to be communicated. This ability to perceive and react to unlimited simultaneous events is a basic characteristic of each whole self or entity. Therefore, I do not claim it as some feat that is exclusively my own. Each reader being presently ensconced within a physical form, I presume, knows only a small portion of himself, as I mentioned earlier. The entity is the overall identity of which his personality is one manifestation, an independent and eternally valid portion in these communications, therefore, Rupert's consciousness expands and yet focuses in a different dimension, a dimension between his reality and mine, a field relatively free of distraction. Here I impress certain concepts upon him with his permission and assent. They are not neutral in that all knowledge or information bears the stamp of the personality who holds it or passes it on. Rupert makes his verbal knowledge available for our use, and quite automatically the two of us together cause the various words that will be spoken. Distractions can occur as any information can be distorted. We are used to working together now, however, and the distortions are very few. Some of my energy is also projected through Rupert, and his energy and mine both activate his physical form during our sessions. And now as I speak these sentences, there are many other ramifications that I will discuss later. I am not therefore, a product of Rupert's subconscious, any more than he is a product of my subconscious mind. Nor am I a secondary personality, cleverly trying to undermine a precarious ego. 
I have seen to it, in fact, that all portions of Rupert's personality are benefited and their integrity maintained and honored. There is within his personality a rather unique facility that makes our communications possible. I will try to put this as simply as possible. There is within his psyche what amounts to a transparent dimensional warp that serves almost like an open window through which other realities can be perceived a multi-dimensional opening that has to some extent escaped being clouded over by the shade of physical focus. The physical senses usually blind you to these open channels, for they perceive reality only in their own image. To some extent, then, I enter your reality through a psychological warp in your space and time. In a manner of speaking, such an open channel serves much as a pathway between Rupert's personality and my own, so that communication is possible between. Such psychological and psychic warps between dimensions of existence are not infrequent. They are merely recognized as such infrequently and utilized even less so. I will try to give you some idea of my own non-physical existence. Let it serve to remind you that your own basic identity is as non-physical as my own. That is the end of chapter one. Peace, light, and love. Aloha.